Okay. Can you see my slides now and hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm pleased to be with you today. And I'm sure all of us can um, pretty much deliver the comments and observations that I'm going to share, as I think they're pretty realistic and apply to many of us in academic research libraries in the, um, since the pandemic started. And um, what we've done during the pandemic in its peak and what we're doing now, sort of a post-pandemic um, realignments. So I'm going to, um, oops, I thought I had a slideshow. Okay, so I'm going to focus on the relationship between um, collections, services, and impact with partnerships that libraries and librarians have formed um, over the last few years and what the impact might be for that going forward. So in a snapshot, we have um, what we've done um, during the pandemic. And we really realigned ourselves very quickly to accommodate change. And most of that was to accommodate remote services. And that included the majority of things that were instruction related and how to make resources um, sufficiently available for that purpose. And also to keep labs functioning and the research um, barometer on most um, campuses actively focused. So we can see that collections did play a big role and many of us maybe weren't ordering print as much, but we switched and um, added big um, numbers of volumes in e-resources. And we looked at media quite differently with the opportunity to stream things for classroom use or for student activities. And we also looked at what did this mean for literacy and what did it mean for um, course materials in general? Did it accelerate our interest in OERs and ACMs, and is that a long-term situation that we'll be devoted to going forward? Or were we really looking at linking material more sufficiently in um, content management systems as we depended on those to operate for an operational focus? So that was a big piece of what we did. So the political landscape dictated a lot of what we did. The last two years was full of turmoil. We also had to deal with this misinformation, disinformation, um, malinformation concept and how to direct readers and users, particularly students, to accurate sources. There was a tremendous amount of distrust in a lot of social norms, including policing, there were lots of issues with gun violence that continue unfortunately until today and growth in issues of hate crimes on some on campuses, some in communities, some in large cities, some in small, smaller towns. And we really had to um, accommodate that with um, relief and coverage, news coverage, um, media coverage, et cetera. A greater picture of that was really racial injustice in general. And we had to think about that in the light of um, diversity. So we had um, more of an effort was made, I think, in the last few years to address anti-racism, social and restorative justice, and some of the unevenness in our um, lives due to labor and economics, um, in the last year, we've seen a spike in inflation, tremendous amount of food insecurity, and global concerns as particularly the Eastern European Ukrainian situation has gone on far longer than any of us anticipated with supply chain um, challenges. So if we were buying print and books were coming from printers in Asia, where many of them come from, that was a huge um, 
issue as well. So that was um, problematic. In addition, we had um, social we had social challenges, and I think this issue of um, loss and bereavement. We did a lot of work in that area and added resources for that, as well as just general support for mental health. And um, what we heard from our readers is that they were isolated, they were tired of being disconnected, but they weren't necessarily reading a lot. Most of us were swimming in a lot of usage data and the spikes were not, at least in the monographic material from what I can gather in the literature, did not compensate for the anticipated demand that many of us in the library field or in publishing may have expected. Most importantly, we were using technology in novel and new ways and um, thinking about that. And um, communication methods changed a lot as um, students had uneven connectivity. And that was a big um, issue. The roles of diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and social justice, or whatever order your acronym, uh, the acronym your institution adopts, is um, has been a call for disruption. And I share this quote from Amy Brand, the press director at MIT, when she said, I read this, basically I'm working to disrupt how we communicate science so it can have the most beneficial impact on society. This includes new business models, new technical standards, and new publishing technologies. We prototype these new models for communicating science and scholarship because traditional models are holding back progress. So that was from a talk um, earlier this year. And I think that really summarizes sort of how I'm thinking of what's going on. So what does this mean for libraries and for publishers? The impact on libraries with the focus being and the academic research concept, but a problem, you know, all academic libraries, is that we work and continue to be very concerned about students' well being, making sure that they can continue to graduate on time, their needs and comforts are being met, and that they're um, able to access resources from wherever they are. And we tried to fill in gaps. We had to, in many cases, fill different formats, et cetera. We've also been in the library field, not unlike publishing, but definitely had our challenges with hiring and with normal attrition due to retirements or resignations, filling gaps and conducting interviews and onboarding people at all levels has been problematic. And with the students not being on campus, we really had to fill in for our student workers when they weren't present. The emphasis on print, um, I think, um, will continue to be a challenge as many libraries invested heavily in electronic resources, and that meant a lot of different kinds of things. Um, collections and study spaces were um, reconfigured, and we're looking at that to um, replace um, warehousing um, situations. So the ter technological paradigms of artificial intelligence, I think, was something that libraries spent the last two years investigating quite a lot and how to leverage technology to aid the student experience, but also the research experience at the other end. I think most libraries um, really created new services relevant to campus priorities and um, redefine their strategic directions a lot. To, and whether those are here to stay or not will remain to be seen, but I definitely think the operational models were um, challenged and we began to prioritize things quite differently. And protections were always um, at the highest level to increase chances of student success and the accumulation of what is our building gonna be like in the future? Will it continue to attract students when they're on campus or will they use the building for different things? Or are we at risk for real estate um, takeovers by other units on campus? So probably a little bit of all of that. And those transitions are, I think, um, the way of the future. So what realignments are coming down? 
in my library, usage continues to dictate the future role of collections. And we are spending more money than we ever did before, but we're not buying the same kinds of things as we did two years ago. So we recreated and used collection dollars to um, allow for different kinds of things, direct um, sale, send of print materials to users wherever they were and processing things differently. Curbside pickups, are we gonna continue to do that? Um, I really perceive there's going to be a dramatic change in the role of interlibrary loan and what that means with more e-content and changing optics with our um, consortia partners and members. So I think we all did business with different and new vendors than we have in the past and um, because of the kinds of services they could offer. And we had stronger collaborations with faculty as we helped them restore what they could do in an online environment. So most libraries also saw an increase in um, online services like chat, research consultations via Zoom, engagements on demand, extending things, you know, pretty much in virtual recorded fashions and archiving them, et cetera. So it's all about OA, I think, in many environments. And <clears throat> excuse me, the flexibility is a key factor of maintaining. And we want to really think about the ethics and copyright functions of OA and um, what that means. So one of the direct applications was in the educational resources, open education, journals, transformative agreements with um, many partners, publishing partners and societies, and um, especially in STEM fields, but it's expanding everywhere. Um, collection dollars were redirected in many cases to cover some APC fees and um, subscription models have um, really been redefined. Um, many libraries had very strong models of institutional repositories. I think some of those are changing as OA has expanded and um, processing workflows to include more OA content is important. Preprints have, you know, through the pandemic, but just not in the health and life sciences, but all over have expanded exponentially. And I think we're looking at online monographs that are open and um, working with different publishing factors um, and options. And that could be even self-publishing. So collection budgets often, um, cover OA investments, and we're seeing a lot of that. So staying the course, I would say that there's gonna be just more of everything open, and we better get used to it if we're not you know, anticipating that, because there'll be more choices, more author-directed that are increasingly um, focused that way, and um, the idea of public and all library services. So I think we're going to see, you know, open science expand a tremendous amount. We're also going to see continued emphasis on promoting student success, whatever that means, whether it means hosting events and um, having more exhibits and promoting our collections through technology support and filling um, gaps when that's not possible running personal librarian programs to contact students and make sure they're um, able to um, deliver what they need to, to be successful. And just campus activities, being more central in everything that we do. And I think going forward, we wanna think about how this impacts us. If anything, I think it really redirects scholarly communication. There will be a major rethink and a revision of some of those services. And if anything, it'll be expanded and um, more reflective of more diversity and whatever that's constituted as. The demand for digital uh, resources will remain and um, 
textbooks have changed tremendously and students have really put up a resistance to um, paying for textbooks and ex have expectations that that will be provided for them. So I think that model of investing in textbooks will change dramatically um, going forward. Concerns about um, uniform connectivity and the kinds of uh, devices students and users will ha uh, depend on will change. And I think more of it will just be the phone, the phone, the phone, rather than the laptop and other things. Um, we'll definitely be refining content management systems more and more to accommodate more services and more content and to feel make us feel safe with our copyright um, rhythms and needs. And I think the laboratory environments will also change with more digital tools to help um, users in different, both, um, both observational and um, practical um, environments. Experiential learning and internships has become a way of the future and students feel that you know, their future is dimmed without that. But the new emphasis will reflect this more digital scholarship, whether it be digital humanities or digital anything, but let's call it digital scholarship in general. Special collections will continue to broaden in scope and um, flourish in this environment because of making those materials more user-friendly in the classroom and um, for students without having to come in and use them in a restricted environment. I definitely see libraries extending themselves to more open access models, not just with resources, but in terms of um, being open around the clock. And hybrid services will be more and more the norm that we'll be having classes in person, but we'll also be taping them and making them available for students who can't attend. And I think that function of distance education will take on and bridge some of those gaps. I think we just have to be flexibility, uh, be flexible and exercise that and assume that um, change is the new norm. Links between acquisitions, cataloging, and preservation will continue to be um, emphasized and we'll see different emphases and technical services as things come more processed. And we, um, with a more electronic focus, have to do things um, differently and faster. Subject disciplines will be reshaped by new models of liaison work. And I think, you know, the STEM librarian having a STEM background has already been a day, you know, has not always been consistent as much as we try to get achieve that. So I think that's gonna change. So the new realities are fiscal awareness. I think costs of things are um, very central to everything we consider and staffing models are going to change. Whether we'll have the intensity of the librarians to user ratios that we've had in the past or whether we'll need new staff to with different specialties to accommodate some of the services that we're doing will continue to, um, I think, be a question, be questionable and how we fill that. So the role of the library I see is having these four elements, community building, emphasis and in instruction and new models, learning to do without, instead of saying, oh yes, we can do everything, and implications for resource building and new models for sharing. As I said, I think um, interlibrary loan will be the first big thing to have major changes. The impact for publishers is supply chain for print and paper for those who are buying print and supplying that, packaging content. Many um, publishers and vendors are um, addressing 
the need for more diversity by packaging collections and resources and making them cost attractive so that we'll buy packages rather than buy the title or buy the drink or on demand. And we'll see, hoping that will be a more sustainable model. I think we're still going to be um, struggling with DRM free and how we achieve that and the licensing terms. We, I mentioned textbooks on concurrent usage is a huge thing. Um, many publishers won't sell textbooks to libraries in the, in the way that we need to make them available. Captioning for streaming has to be you know, built in. That platform flexibility has to be um, intuitive to all users. And we need to really think about indemnification and what that means going forward. So I think that's the big thing. So sort of to wrap things up, we'll be working with agents, vendors, and suppliers, I think, going forward. But there might be a different constitution of them and a different um, goals. A lot of new companies came out in the last few years, and I think um, they're addressing specialized needs and more niche practices that many libraries are thinking are attractive. So the role of consortia, whether they adopt these uh, more globally for its members or whether um, it changes how we do workflow locally in the libraries. I think we'll address both of that. They'll be, as I said, more specialized middle men or middle users or middle um, providers or purveyors and subscription or membership costs for libraries. We've kind of rejected that in recent years. I think we're gonna come back to that because um, if the savings are, as um, have been suggested, it's attractive. Approval plans, how we get these materials and um, we'll go on to continue to struggle with document demand um, or evidence-based services. And I think the more that vendors and publishers can make those available easily with easy licensing contracts, the more attractive they'll be. So I think that's a big piece there. So what is next? Choices, flexibility, a, a refined scholarly communications model or a new ethos and global sharing is important. So I think the social justice piece of this is really important as so many changes have taken place through government decisions or legal um, court decisions, et cetera. More partnerships and collaboration. We need to have faster product outputs and get things when needed. Readers will continue to use apps and phones as their primary devices and the amount of writing that students do, I think will change, but how they're gonna conduct that writing and um, whether libraries need to provide that structure or not is unknown. Publishers will compress, and I think the mergers and acquisitions are nowhere near being over, but there'll be a lot more compression among publishers to extend their services to do new things and to take on um, new relationships. Reading and literacies, literacies will um, be focused on born digital. It won't be the exception, but it'll be the norm. And all this means is how do we remain relevant? So here are some references that help um, influence some of the comments I've shared. And um, I'm sure you're familiar with most of them, but I hope that we'll have a chance to open some discussion and you can share how your libraries and you are uh, STEM librarians addressing some of these issues. So thank you again for the opportunity to share some ideas I've been kind of um, thinking about and I look forward to your input.
delighted to um, to be here. I actually got into libraries because um, I thought with a, a master's in, in math, I should be totally qualified to be a science librarian. And <laughs> it turns out maybe these days it would be, but I wasn't um, at that point. So, um, and it's it's been a really interesting uh, journey. So I'm um, very much looking forward to discussion um, to know what people teaching the next generation of librarians ought to know so that um, the new hires get the right stuff um, to, to come in. Um, so I want to talk about uh, retractions, which, as, as Jeff said, I've been uh, looking at for uh, for some time through a project funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And um, retraction, I didn't know what retraction was till I started study, studying it. So um, basically, um, when you know, literature gets peer review, we, we sort of approve it for publication. Retraction is kind of unapproving it, saying that um, something is uh, seriously flawed and shouldn't be relied on. And um, a lot of the work that I've done has has looked at, um, you know, for 30 years, people have been studying, starting with, with Garfield, people have been studying the fact that, that um, publications continue to be cited even after they're retracted, even though um, there, there are these, um, these problems that are known. Um, and so what can we do about that? Um, so some basics about retraction, it's meant to correct the literature when uh, correction notices are insufficient. Something like one in 1300 articles is retracted, very small number, but um, retraction um, really started in you know, roughly the 1980s. Earlier things have been retracted, but only since then. Um, it happens in all fields. 60% of retraction actually is in engineering. Most of what gets researched is, is in medicine. Um, so there's a kind of mismatch there. Um, some of the reasons for retraction are unethical research, um, redundant publication, and issues with data and or results. It's important to know that sometimes people retract their own uh, publications. And, and maybe some of you have had experiences with people coming to ask for um, help when something has gone wrong and they need to retract something themselves. Um, and I, to me, it's really important to know that uh, it's part of a healthy science ecosystem, right? Doing robust science, we make mistakes. And um, sometimes those are really fundamental and, and we have to um, rethink entire pieces of, of what we thought we knew. Um, and, and retraction is in uh, is is one way of explicitly marking things so that we know don't rely on them. Um, retraction uh, can take decades. Um, I have uh, an example of a, an article that was retracted 45 years after it was published. Um, sometimes it's days, very rarely, um, but you know months is possible. Years is most common. Um, so it can take several years for something to get retracted. And of course, it can be in the literature just looking like any other publication at that time. Um, and what I've particularly been concerned about is that people may cite and use retracted work, even when there are really fundamental problems um, with the data or the results or something like that. Um, so I, I studied um, for a while a, um, a paper that had been published in 2005, retracted in, in 2008. When we looked at it, um, you know, we looked first at up to, to 2019, the sort of first 11 years of this, and we found that that the paper was continued continuing to be cited, and its citations were also had the potential to spread misinformation. Um, one of the problems was that um, the the linking was was problematic. Um, only one database that we tested could could link us out to the retraction notice. And um, you know the open URLs were using things like the author information, and the author of the of the paper was not the same as the author of the retraction notice, so that just didn't work. Um, and here are examples of the error messages that we um, that we saw. Um, there are all sorts of problems with spotting that things are retracted. Um, so my colleague uh, Liz Sulzer and and um, uh, some of of, of her. Uh, colleagues looked at um, challenges in discovering the retracted status of an article. Um, they have a, a Gemma Network open article about this, but before that, um, they they wrote a something up for the workshop that I ran, and they gave these examples. These are two of the examples that they gave, where um, same journal scientific reports, and um, on the left you see that this article was retracted, has this little um, you know. Um, 
warning sign with an exclamation point in red, right? On the right-hand side, you don't see that. So if you were used to looking for, okay, it should be in red, there should be this, this thing, um, we see a retraction of this article was published, right? But the um, it makes it really difficult to see. Um, and, and they're widely um, demonstrated examples of problems in this, these sort of display sorts of issues. Not to mention that um, the, the data doesn't sort of move around. If you, one of the infamous um, uh, retractions in the New England Journal of Medicine around COVID was um, this article about um, using, using, well, it's purportedly using um, a, a database that do, does not seem to, to, have, to have ever existed. And if you, if you search for it, um, if you do if you do click on CL results here, you'll find the, the expression of concern saying that the article looked problematic and you'll see the retraction notice. But um, this it would be very difficult to to spot just from the search that this is um, retracted. Um, and that's really a common problem, not just at databases and search engines, but um, but at publisher sites uh, in some cases as well. Um, retraction Watch is a great place to follow the news about retraction. Um, they are um, um, investigative journalists, so there's a little bit of the sort of muckracking feel to things, but they have a lot of really good quality um, information um, that, um, you know, if you want to know what's retracted about COVID-19, they've got a list of 230. And as George says, PubMed, Yes. So, so if every database did what PubMed did, which is put a big, consistent pink thing, you know, at the front, this is retracted. Give a note that links you directly to the retraction notice. That that would would really help. Um, and and in general, retracted articles are not deleted from the publishers' websites. Um, and there's there's the intention that they're that they they're made open access. Um, in fact, and um, and so the the publications may be in um, in in view, uh, but there it's it's just really really challenging um, because they're not necessarily watermarked. The article that I'd been studying um, for the whole time that I was 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 looking at it, the publisher site did not have any watermarking, and we think maybe that was because it it, it had gotten transferred from one journal to the other, but we we don't really know, um, and it's not it's not rare to have. Um, to have these watermarking problems, it's, it's really pretty common. Um, and I, from the articles that I read, it seems like 30% when people are looking um, in inside, I mean, all of the literature, um, that, that almost all the literature is about, um, uh, you know, specialties of medicine and people look and they say, here's what's what's retracted, let's look at it. And then, and, and then they, they observe um, in general, something like 30% of the articles are, are not watermarked. Um, in, in some way or other, or the, or the, the web page is, is not there. Um, and it's a great field to study more of outside of, right? I mean, there, there's a, there are a couple of librarians who, who've been studying uh, this in, in engineering, right? It's very, um, you know, there's a dissertation and, and three articles, on, or two articles and one coming out. So a great, great area to study. Um, I, so the expressions of concern on, on COVID, I would take a look at the Retraction Watch page. They are they are pushing together. I mean, they're including preprints, and I think they're including um, they may be including expressions of concern in that in that as well. Um, and and there, you know, the um, Ivan Aransky who runs Retraction Watch is probably the first person to point out there is no more retraction than we would expect compared to other other areas. It's just that the the literature comes out quickly. There's a lot of interest. There's a lot of 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 kind of going going back and checking, right? If if nobody ever goes and, and looks at an article, the only people who could retract it are the authors. Um, so so attention tends to um, bring at least the opportunity for discovering problems that could lead to retraction. Um, so other other things in this in this sort of space. Um, again, in terms of like how bad is it that you know, sort of finding things, of course, beyond the publisher site, um, anybody could take a copy of a, of a PDF and, and put it up. And we know that that you can find lots and lots and lots of copies. So one of the first um, articles that was retracted about COVID-19 um, claimed a link to 5G technology, which, which of course has been very influential in the public, unfortunately, um, was retracted. 
And um, there's uh, uh, some, some work that uh, Frampton and, and his colleagues did. There's this great plus one article where um, they, they looked at various things, but the thing that st really stands out to me in, in what they're, they're doing is finding the number of different copies that, that are out there of this article um, that are very easy for, um, for an end user to find. It's very hard to figure out that something is retracted just, you know, just by sort of coming across it and looking. There, I mean, there are tools that, that people can use, um, but you have to be looking for that information. It's not really um, put in front of you, especially, um, you know, and there's no more retraction in open access than, than in anything else. But of course, if, if the things are disseminated further and, and copied um, in, in more places because they're open access or, or, or perhaps they're pirated, right? Just the same. So, um, so those are kind of enduring problems. Um, another one of my favorite findings about um, uh, the COVID-19 retractions, which is, I think, relevant for those of you who, who are um, uh, subject specialists and, and kind of closely in touch with um, uh, with people who, who are um, uh, publishing uh, in the sciences that, um, so the, these, these Surgisphere articles where the database does not appear to, 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 to have, have ever existed, um, there were guidelines about, um, you know, uh, routine, what the, the guidelines are for a particular kind of observational research that's called like routinely collected data from um, electronic health records. And, they, those guidelines require a description of the database population, how the database was created, the accuracy, and, and so on. That was not described. And um, the, the guidelines that, that are there for, for reporting were, were not really assessed. Um, and this is in contrast to um, some of the, I mean, they're basically the, the guidelines here, there's strobe guidelines, which are these general observational guidelines, which are very well, well followed on the whole um, by the journals like Lancet and, and NEJM in, in these cases. And then there's a uh, the record and then the, an, a more specific piece. So, um, so basically the, these two articles that, um, that were um, very, very high profile retractions about um, uh, 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 Using this, um, you know, purported database, um, the, the the missing information should have been been discovered in peer review. If the guidelines had been, you know, checked, they would have seen that that a large pr proportion of the checklist items were not there. Um, and um, and so these the, the these papers um, made a big splash, um, and they were retracted within about a month. Um, they these days have 1,200 citations in one case, 1,400 citations in in another. Um, about six months after they were retracted, um, there was um, a, a science uh, journalism piece where some investigative journalists had looked at uh, 200 of the post retraction citations to um, to these papers. And they concluded over half inappropriately cited the retracted articles. Now, over half sounds awful, but in MySpace, that's actually really good. It turns out that um, it's it's more like 94% um, inappropriate citation in, in biomedicine in, in general. Um, so I uh, worked with a PhD student. We looked at um, everything um, we, we could get full text of in, in PubMed Central, looked at, you know, pulling um, the sentences around the citations and um, compared that to, to things that are retracted in PubMed. And as we mentioned earlier, PubMed is the, probably the best source for, for, for what's retracted inside its field. So the problem there should not be lack of awareness, shouldn't be, but, um, but it seems to be because the citations um, to the retracted articles just look like everyday citations, right? Um, a study confirmed that this, you know, treatment, it can achieve a faster wound healing rate. Only one study to date has demonstrated such and such, right? Just normal citations. And we looked at, you know, where in the article, same locations as, as before they were retracted. So this continued citation and um, inappropriate citation, right? Where where the stuff is used as though it's it's um, making a claim is it's really really common. I mean that's in contrast to, for instance, um, I think 
um, the, the most infamous retracted article would be the Wakefield article that purports um, MMR and, and, and autism are related. Um, and very, very highly cited, most of the citations to that article are um, pointing out the impact that it's had on public discourse. So, so there, you know, there's different kinds of citation. Yes, there is definitely a possibility of negative citation. It it's generally not what's what's going on in the the cases that I've seen, um, and um, it certainly is one of the things that's going on in in the um, in the Wakefield cor corpus. And you know, Liz Solzer has a great paper looking exactly at um, at citation context, and this is you know a great opportunity for a team to do work of that sort on um, on other topics and sort of more detailed you know, looking at these sentences. Um, so the intentional citation um, in the, this, I mean, this is is out of the, the sentences that, that we were looking at in, you know, sort of scale of hundreds out of um, that that 13,000 that we, we started with. Um, often it is, um, well, you're studying the things that are retracted like I'm doing. Maybe it's a systematic review. You're talking about um, some sort of exclusion rationale. Um, maybe you're giving related work. Occasionally, you're trying to reproduce something, um, and often it's that that sort of historical kind of function. Um, could researchers be lazy citing things that others have cited? Um, we know that happens. Um, there's a, a great article by uh, my my colleague Dave Dubin, who's who's written about um, an information retrieval article that Salton never wrote that got um, that got cited a lot here. Uh, it's hard to know. Um, it's it's really um, so. One of the things that that's that the challenge is how long is it between um, the publication of the original article, the retraction of the original article, and where does that fall? And when people are writing, um, and you know, is anybody checking? Um, if if something is retracted in the meantime. So there's some sense that maybe we go out to give authors a little bit of leeway and, you know, how long is, you know, two years, is that a reasonable amount of time to keep citing something because maybe it wasn't retracted when you first looked at it or something like that. Uh, but yeah, it's we can't rule out that um, that there's copying of citations could could certainly be one of the problems. Um, so the project that I um, that I've been um, working on this uh, uh, reducing the inadvertent spread of retracted science. This has been uh, yeah researchers may download articles prior to retraction for sure. And then if you have your pile of PDFs, how are you keeping them and, and so on? So um, having a um, you know a, a dialogue amongst people to try to figure out what's you know what are the problems in this space? What's you know what can we do about um, reducing, you know, citation when it's it's not, you know, kind of this this intentional, um, meaningful um, uh, citation. Um, so, so I had a, an advisory board who were pictured here. A number of um, particularly medical librarians were involved in in the process. I didn't know until, you know. Laura, like halfway through the, the project, how much of the retraction was actually in um, outside medicine because people are not so, you know, writing so much about that. Um, and um, so this this project got funded in, in February 2020. So we we plan to have a day and a half um, online, a, a day and a half meeting in Chicago, which turned into three half days um, meeting, but it was a series of interviews and people coming to talk about what are the problems of retraction, what are the possible solutions, a um, literature review, which if you're you're interested in, in these topics, there's um, there's there's lots and lots and lots that's um, that's been written. So um, here's a pile of the empirical work that I've been able to find. This is old. This is um, this is up to um, July 2021, so it's it's about a year out of date. I'm hoping to have resources to update it and, and kind of steward this because the literature is super dispersed all over the place. Um, and then the citation analysis that I um, that I told you about. Um, so one of the things that we came out up, up with out of this process was what are some things that could could make a change in the citation of, um, of retracted research. 
And um, the first thing is the, the, the one that's getting, getting some traction, which is to develop a systematic cross-industry approach to ensure the public availability of consistent, standardized, um, interoperable, and timely information about retractions. Um, there's, there are other things that need to be done. Um, a taxonomy of retraction categories and classifications and, and metadata. And the challenge here is there, you know, people have categories, but they don't agree with one another. And it's hard to get too deep into the categories because um, it's important, uh, you know, there's sort of disciplinary decisions about what, what gets retracted, why things get retracted, and so on. Um, Best practices for coordinating the retraction process are um, are really important. There's been um, uh, one uh, one thing that happened while we were uh, were working on this is there was a report about collaboration between um, um, publishers and, um, and and universities, the Clue report. Um, so that's moving things forward to that um, a bit. And then really educating stakeholders, which I encourage anybody who has instruction roles to um, think about, you know, what do people know about what happens after things get published and what do they need to know, right? I mean, not all of it is retraction. It's also correction. And there are, I mean, um, horrifying, um, uh, you know, stories about what is not um, taken account of, right? Even even when it's quantitative stuff. So like, you know, physics corrections that that would make a material difference that when they, those are cited, nobody is, is using the, the updated numbers. Um, so I think there's there's all sorts of like, you know, using the literature and, and as, as, you know, author sort of, sort of training. Um, and I'm really happy to talk to people about, you know, what I know about this, but I'd, I'd love to learn what's sort of the current practice um, because, you know, that's, I'm a, I, I'm in the classroom. I'm not in the in in the the um, you know in, in sort of practice properly. Um, so um, the most exciting thing that's come out of um, this project is it gave rise to a standards group. Um, we we gave a talk at NISA Plus um, in 2021 when we we're sort of just forming the recommendations, and that um, has led to this uh, working group that started meeting last month um, about communication of retractions, removals, and expressions of concern. The goal is um, to focus on metadata and display standards because these are really, really obvious places that need um, that need improvement in places where the um, the um, a whole scholarly publishing community can make a difference. Um, this is going to be an 18 or 20 to 24 month process, and there will be coming out of it some recommendations, right? That ultimately it will it will have the correct recommended practice all going well, and and so it would be great to get feedback on that um, to make sure that whatever we come up with is actually um, understandable, particularly to to readers. Um, uh, so um, someone not an author uh, retracted an article, so. The retraction is is technically this process that can be initiated by anybody, but but ultimately the the editorial team of the journal um, or the book or, or whatnot has to approve it and, and move it forward. Um, so it can be time consuming if someone wants to retract their their own work. Um, that in in some cases that could take more than a year. Um, and and for you know likewise if it's if it's something that is uh, is retracted because there's um, a problem that's you know not coming from the author maybe it's it's a whistleblower or maybe it's um, a a finding of, of misconduct from the uh, university or research institution or something like that um, so it's it's this um, you know the there there are guidelines from um, from from cope which uh, which talk about uh, you know sort of the ideal situation, which is that that people are signing off on yes, it's it's okay to retract it. Um, so let's see. Um, okay, so often is the peer reviewed literature so much better than what they might find in, in Wikipedia? Peer review, yes. Uh, this is so challenging. I so I, I've just finished teaching undergraduates for the first time in 20 years, and I had some students do 
a, you know, I'm teaching a, like a discrete math, math for information sciences course. So I had them do a, an exercise where they were um, writing about uh, some sort of math topic. And I was horrified that all they wanted to use, I mean, this is probably bizarre, but I was horrified that all they wanted to use was, was peer reviewed literature. They, you know, it was like, no, for this for this piece, you, you need some background, you need a textbook or a video lecture. I don't care if it's from YouTube or, you know, something, right? An encyclopedia article. Um, so I, I think it's it's really challenging. Um, so my my view as, as, a, as an instructor, right, from this, this recent experience is um, undergrads need a lot of, um, a lot more information literacy training than they're getting. And um, and so so somehow there's like Wikipedia is like this firewall. It's like okay, we know you can find it. We know you'll search and you'll and you'll find it. So so somehow it's 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 about you know like making things harder, making sure that they're they know how to find things or or something. I don't know. Um, so it it is really challenging. Um, there's um, there's a great article that was about um, using retraction in in um, in college teaching, where they're they're using it really to talk about scientific process. And I think um, it's not the case that um, that peer reviewed literature is worse than Wikipedia. And also, if you think about it, it's also not the case that Wikipedia isn't peer reviewed. I mean, it's it's not, I mean, some parts of Wikipedia are more reviewed than others, and, and there are ways of determining that, but that's sort of getting getting into the weeds of, of Wikipedia. Um, but, you know, what do, what do undergraduates need to know? Um, I think it's at a minimum that not everything they read is correct, whether it's on Wikipedia or whether it's in a peer-reviewed article. Um, and, and hopefully there's some palatable way to get instructors to agree that that's the case. Um, so, um, uh, anyway, um, citations of retracted articles aren't being caught in the editorial process. Recommendations, um, if you're responsible for a journal, uh, check the citations. It's not hard. <laughs> and if you're using, if it's against the biomedical literature, it's, it's easy because it's, it's fairly available. Otherwise, retraction watch data, which you have to license. Um, anyway, thanks for, for a delightful conversation. And um, I'm, I'm hoping after, you know, that, that was the end of my talk. And so I think that was the end of the, the Q&A. And maybe we have wider, uh, wider discussion.